Hi everyone, I'm Gary Nall. Today we're going to learn about how good bacteria in the gut can help decrease your chance of a stroke. This comes from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, published in Nature Medicine. Also in our health and nutrition segment today, how the nutrients you consume can boost your stem cell function. Very good article I read from Caroline Myers. And since we're doing a lot of research on stem cell function, I'm doing a lot of research on it. In fact, one of the basics of slowing down the aging process is having younger stem cells. Well, how do you get them? We'll talk about that. Also today, quercetin's unique protective mechanisms. Um, Michael Enders did a very good piece on that. I'll share some of that with you. Also, a common antibiotic found to cause delirium. That's not good. And brain disorders, that's worse. Harvard Medical School. A lot of people are taking antibiotics today. That's that's unfortunate because though it can protect you and save your life from certain type of bacteria, there is no benefit to taking the antibiotics if you have, let's say, a viral infection like a cold or flu. Yet people are loading up on it, not realizing it can impact your brain. But also today, I will be dealing with some other topics, and I'll ask you to call in and share your points of view when we get to those topics. For example... Uh, in one case, we have the Washington, D.C. area, the District of Columbia, passes a bill to vaccinate children without parental knowledge or even consent. Do you accept or reject that? Because once something starts one place, you know that it's going to be implied in other uh, circumstances. So I'd like your input. I'll save my comments for later on that. Also today, we're going to do part one of a two-part series from this very good site. It's called Gravitas Plus. Who will bear the cost of the pandemic? So we're going to take a look at that also. And then we have Brendan O'Neill about the hysterical display of wokeness that we've never seen before, but we did. And then I have an article. Richard Gale and I just wrote a new article. It will answer a lot of questions. Will the COVID vaccine meet its promises? I've posted it on prn.fm so you can download it. And, uh, and then I'm also going to, uh, we're going to get a comment from Chris Hedges, our ever deadlier police state. And I'll try to get some more insights shared with you about America's apocalyptic debt crisis because that is behind everything going on now. And the rich and powerful will not be the ones who pay those debts. You and I will. And that's not right. It's not fair. But unfortunately, it's just what is. So that's what we're dealing with today. So let's begin. I want to begin by talking again something we should be doing every day, and that is getting good probiotics into our body. You can certainly get those through food, like apple cider vinegar. Gives you some, put it on a salad. Then apple cider, which is fermented apples, and it's the fermenting process that creates the probiotic or prebiotics. That's why when you're having something like beet juice from beetroot, and uh, it's a little on the sweet side, uh, but it's not going to fluctuate your blood sugar, but it's great to take before you do a workout, or it's great if you have a heart attack or stroke because it increases nitric oxide, which dilates your arteries, makes the blood be able to flow easier through them, and uh, it's just terrific all the way around. But it also creates prebiotics, sauerkraut. There's a lot of prebiotics in that. You can get the low-sodium sauerkraut, kimchi, and others. Uh, I would say for the average person, all your tofu and tempeh dishes and miso dishes. There's a very mild low-sodium miso. It is a chickpea miso, kind of like a, a little off-white, and it's not that strong. And I generally make a bowl of, well, you can actually make a large bowl so you have enough for three or four days. But in it, you put your scallions, shallots, 
onions, garlic, ginger, seaweed, and that is just one terrific combination to keep your immune system strong. And it's very tasty, but you're loading up with good probiotics. So in any case, when we take good by uh, the good bacteria into our body, and uh, we're getting it every day, by the way, your body has more bacteria by a factor of 10 than it does cells. You have anywhere from 50 to 75 trillion cells, more or less depending upon your size. So you get an idea. You've got a lot of bacteria. Some can be bad. Eating sugar and meat and alcohol, refined carbohydrates, you create bad bacteria. Having health, a healthy, clean food, like a clean plant-based diet, you create good bacteria. Well, certain types of bacteria, according to Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, can, um, can leverage the immune system to decrease the severity of a stroke. And that's very important. This is research from the Cornell Medicine. So if you want to mitigate a stroke, there's a lot you can do. An onion a day, a raw onion a day, can help you mitigate a stroke. Cayenne pepper can help mitigate a stroke. Vitamin E, tocotrienols, coenzyme Q10, magnesium, all can help mitigate a stroke. But in this case, it's the bacteria in your gut. And so if you have, let's say you're taking antibiotics, you're killing almost all the good bacteria but you're allowing the production of bad bacteria. And unfortunately, that can lead to what is called an ischemic, I-S-C-H-E-M-I-C, stroke, uh, which is an obstruction of a, you know, the, in the blood vessel that prevents blood from reaching the brain. And, uh, but the microbial environment in the gut directed the immune system cells there to protect the brain, and that's what they found out. So it shielded it from the stroke's full force just by having good bacteria. Now, this is new. This is brand new information. So one more reason to pay attention to getting probiotics into your body every day help mitigate a stroke. Also today, on dealing with the common antibiotic, um, this is from Harvard Medical School. And it's telling us that, that if we have too many antibiotics in our system that can destroy the helpful gut bacteria, and that's one of the reasons to avoid any non-life-threatening or life-saving antibiotics. So researchers reviewing mountains of scientific data found hundreds of cases where patients develop delirium and other brain problems after receiving common everyday antibiotics, and especially in the elderly. Delirium is particularly serious with an increased risk of complications of recovery. And it wasn't just one type of antibiotic. It was a full spectrum of antibiotics that can cause this devastating adverse effect to the brain. This was done at both Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. So if you need an antibiotic, if it's absolutely essential, okay. But if not, don't use them. This was published in the journal Neurology. Now, sometimes in science and in counseling, you don't have an answer. You only have an educated question, will, uh, let's say, will flooding the body with a particular anti-inflammatory agent help the body be able to rebalance itself? But to rebalance, you have to first detoxify. And one of the biggest mistakes we make in our society is we don't detoxify, we don't cleanse. Instead, we simply add something that we hear about into our system as if that's what we need, the magic silver bullet. All the time I'll talk with people who have a terrible diet, but they say they take extra vitamin C or B complex. And so I say, okay, what do you think would be the outcome if you had a good diet and you took those vitamins and you detoxified? And 
then they kind of look pu in a puzzled way at you. And I, and I said, well, let me explain it this way. We now know that every one of your cells is damaged, injured. We're talking about 50 to 75 trillion cells are damaged or injured 10,000 times every 24 hours. Well, suddenly they get this look about, what? Yeah, yeah. That's why some people at the same age, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, they look differently, they act differently, they function differently. And it's because of how much damage has cumulatively occurred in a person versus how much has not occurred where the person is actually accumulative on the side of health. So let's just say, for example, I'll just give you one simple example. When people come to a retreat, there's no, no one's diagnosed or treated for anything in a retreat. It's just a wonderful way to relax and detoxify and de-stress and to enjoy themselves with lectures and counseling and, and yoga and meditation and whatnot. But then at the end of that, you hear these remarkable, unrehearsed, unscripted testimonials. In fact, I'm just in a, the a staff kitchen uh, dining area, and we, uh, I have a telephone, and they just line up and come in, those who want to, it's voluntary, and say, I just finished a week at Gary's place, and uh, here's, uh, here's what I experienced. Now, mind you, these are people who have traveled all over. We have a very educated audience, a um, worldwide audience, so they've been places, and a lot of them are very successful, professionals, lawyers, doctors, engineers, architects, and they generally like to go to places with a high-quality standard of living. They have a good time at those places. They have some memorable moments. None of those changes their health. This place does. Why? Here's the outcome. Juicing. All they want all day, all day. No animal proteins, no foods or chemicals or beverages that create inflammation that causes those 10 to 12,000 gene alterations per day. So half of all the things that would cause a gene to be altered are not there. Green time, relaxing, de-stressing. The brain is not flooded with cortisol that destroys neurons. So therefore, relax, and your blood sugar relaxes, your blood pressure comes down, your inflammatory markers like uh, cytokines come down, tumor necrosis factor alpha, endorphins come down, and suddenly, well, your endorphins actually go up, you, you feel better. So now you're not only not putting your cells in harm's way, by causing inflammation and destroying them, altering them, damaging them, which prematurely ages you. But now you start taking in foods and the nutrients in foods, vegan diet, or the juices that detoxify. People will suddenly say, wow, I, you know, my whole body's regulatory system is changing. I, you know, I'm, I'm cleansing myself much more frequently, much more completely than what would be normal at home. So now you're getting rid of the clutter. You're getting rid of the damage and dead debris. You're rebalancing your biochemistry. You're stimulating your immune system. In a week or two, now you come out and you've had something of a, a physical epiphany. Something's happened that was unexpected in a positive way that's given you insights. The wise person goes home and simply, as best they can, continues doing what they learned in which case over a period of two to three years, they could de-age as many as 10 to 15 years biochemically. Now, mind you, we've got to get beyond this notion that we're a chronological age. I have a friend. He's been a friend for 30 years. We're close friends. He's an older friend. He's 81 years of age. He is always fretting about his health. And I said, you're in the one you're probably one of only a hundred people your age 
on the planet who's in as good a shape as you are. So you're not 81 years old. You're probably around 50. And he just he can't wrap his mind around that. He, he, because he's, he's very open in some areas and very closed in others. And, uh, and I said, look in the mirror. You know, you have like 6% body fat. You know, you're, you have strong muscles. You have a very healthy diet. You take your supplements. You're actively engaged every day in issues that give you, you know, passion and pleasure. You have a meaningful existence. You always have. So you're not your age. And I want everyone in the audience to understand that. You are not your chronological age unless you have not paid attention to the accumulation of damage done throughout our life. And all that damage is cumulative. Uh, after this program, I'll be counseling a friend <clears throat> whose family abandoned this person, literally abandoned him. But along the way, you could see it coming. And this person didn't want to acknowledge. And then when it happened that uh, they were suddenly in their 50s out on their own with no support system, they were just crushed. And I said, well, look at it this way. You now know the truth for the first time in your life of what your family actually believes in. And it's not you. And it, helping a person understand how to deal with the reality of that moment can then help them let the past be forgiven, no anger, let it go, and go forward. They're now free to look for the truth where before they were a prisoner of their cultural and familial uh, conditioning. That meant accepting things that were never uh, proven but assumed. Oh, someone's got your back. Oh, someone's not going to betray you. Oh, someone's going to always be there for you. And then, boom, they're not. And then you start seeing that you don't have the, uh, you don't have the tools because you never thought you'd need them. Now you do. So this crisis, this COVID crisis, has put all of us on notice. Do you have the tools to thrive when a society is, uh, is breaking down? Because that's what we like to do. We like to thrive. Hopefully, everybody can thrive. But the reality is people are going to be limited by the resistance of their own belief systems. And by the way, I've been, uh, Jesse, who runs PRN in New York, he's posting almost daily on PRN.fm a series of self-motivating lectures that I did some 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. I just found uh, yesterday, I found 21 more lectures that I did a couple of years ago, and but I never released them. I was working on three major documentaries, and that got my attention. And so now we're putting, posting them up on the, the web. So they're free and they're there. But they're very timely for people who are seeing crisis, all kinds of crisis. Do we have the tools? No. All right, then let's learn. So if you want to de-age, you've got to stop bad habits. But how are you going to stop a bad habit if you don't have the discipline to do it? Or the desire. What if you're so locked into your comforts that your biggest addiction is your comfort, your comfort addict? You'd, you'd like to give up pizza or hot dogs, hamburgers, french fries, whatever it is, but you have a comfort factor that won't allow you to do it. So it's going to take, uh, it's going to take going through that pain of separating yourself from the bad habits, but when you do that, all, all your trillions of cells are going to say, thank you for not causing damage in the next 24 hours. That means we're going to live longer for you. That means to now take those juices, take those supplements, and now we're going to heal. So now you're, we're going to start getting you younger. Your heart rate's going to come down. Your pulse rate's going to come down. Your intestines are going to speed up. Your, your muscles are going to become stronger all of which goes against what your conditioned self says. Well, I'm getting older. I have to get weaker. No, you don't. So that said, everything that we did in our anti-aging study, which I'll be hopefully uh, posting the peer-reviewed published article 
so you can read the full. It's a, it's a, it's a lot of material. It's more than what I could give in two hours on the air. But one of the things at the heart of it, how, was, how we are able to actually physically lengthen a person's lifespan, change their biochemistry, it's the stem cells. Every one of the protocol is meant to stimulate stem cells, and there's scientific evidence for that. This is an article I want to share with you. This is from Caroline Myers in Life Extension. Quote, nutrients boost cell stem function. Recent scientific findings indicate that aging is closely associated with loss of the number and function of adult stem cells throughout the body. Researchers have concluded that protecting those essential stem cells could play an important role in slowing and partially reversing aging. Three studies published last year demonstrate that several nutraceutical compounds are capable of boosting stem cell function. So write them down, people. These studies reveal that extracts from berries and green tea and dipeptide carnosine and vitamin D have the ability to favorably alter gene expression and are capable of exerting powerful regulatory effects on stem cells in their environment. These findings should help crystallize the importance of utilizing natural molecules as a means of slowing aging. And then it goes into the science of it. Aging is associated, quote, with loss of adult stem cell function. Um, it has been shown that connecting the circulation of an older animal with that of a younger one reduces the function of the younger animal's muscles and brain stem cells and appears to accelerate aging. Components in the blood of the older animal interact with stem cells in the younger one, uh, impairing their function. But it works in the reverse also. Younger uh, stem cells in an older animal or an adult suddenly makes the older animal or adult younger at the cellular level. But l let me just explain it so it was, by the way, for multiple sclerosis, it really helps. Stem cells, unlike any other cells in the body, can self-renew and differentiate into many different kinds of cells. Early embryonic stem cells can differentiate in virtually any kind of cell in any kind of tissue. Adults retain stem cells in all their organs and tissues. Adult stem cells can still regenerate and differentiate, but usually only into mature cells in their particular tissue type. When tissue is damaged, and there's your hot dog, hamburger, french fries, alcohol, in any quantity, tissue-specific stem cells leap into action quickly, forming into functional replacements for the damaged cells. In short, adult stem cells account for the healthy adult's ability, body's ability to self-heal and retain its youthful vigor. Recent studies now show that stem cell function declines with advancing age, but that's based upon advancing unhealthy lifestyle. And hence you fall victim to oxidative stress, inflammation, DNA damage, cell phones, that's damaging your DNA. 5G, really damaging it. And uh, living around one of those towers, really, really damaging it. Um, sitting in front of a computer all day, blue light damages it. So you see there's lots of things that will damage it. Fortunately, one of the very causes of stem cell dysfunction can now be leveraged to prevent or reverse such dysfunction, regulation through favorable alteration in gene expression, and that's being done, and hence meditation, and then take in the nutrients like green tea and the berries, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, pomegranate, cherries, all of those berries prevent inflammation, protect your DNA, help repair and enhance the numbers and function of the aging stem cells. So you see, everything I share with you is based upon good science. It's there. I'm going to save quercetin's um, really, really, really good um, repair and de-aging qualities and antiviral qualities, by the way, for tomorrow's show. I'm looking at the clock and running a little, a little behind, but I wanted to give you more insight into how you, no matter where you live, you can do this on your own. We're going to take a break, and when we come back from the break, we're going to hear this 
Gravitas Plus and this investigative journalist at talking about who should bear the cost of the pandemic. Now, we are working around the world to get the best scientists on, non-controversial scientists who are mainstream, who believe that the the COVID-19 virus was leaked, not intentionally, accidentally, from the Wuhan lab. That would make the Chinese government responsible. And since we now know, and it can be proven, no matter how much he lies and denies it, that Anthony Fauci went against what Barack Obama had instructed, that there be no more um, gain of enhancement, meaning you're altering DNA, genetically altering a virus. Now, they can argue, well, we're doing it, you know, for a better vaccine. It's possible, but it's also possible that at Fort Detrick, they were doing it on bacterium and viruses to make biological weapons. That is a fact. They did it. I wrote the definitive article on that in October 1989 when I was able to get some whistleblowers to talk with me and share insights about how the government, including the CIA, had been experimenting on its own population for decades. And 1,900 studies uh, of those experiments, I should say, illegal experiments without informed consent, were done in the American public. Not a single person in the government was held responsible. That tells you how utterly corrupt and vile every one of these governmental agencies is. In any case, so Fauci gets the one of the top scientists at the University of North Carolina, and he can no longer conduct that research there, so he sends three point, I think it was $3.6 million to the Wuhan re, uh, Viral Lab, their top uh, antiviral, uh, their top virus laboratory in China, and the scientist in the University of North Carolina. He went behind the scenes, so he is complicit. Hence, he'll deny, 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 and everyone around him will deny. Oh, we had, it came from nature. Did it? Why is it that a group of scientists at the Institute of Pasteur, including the Nobel Prize winner for the discovery of HIV, Luc Montagnier, said it did not? It was human-made. We have the evidence it was human-made. We have the evidence that it was uh, additional work was done at Wuhan. And now we have a group of scientists saying it was leaked. Now, coincidentally, New York Magazine produces an article. Now, New York Magazine is a pro-establishment magazine. I mean, you see the reporters there on MSNBC in these shows. So the question is, why? Why would this article come out at this time? So who's responsible? Oh, yeah, China. Anthony Fauci, and the other scientists who were part of this. So they're engaged in the cover-up. All good journalists and scientists are engaged in showing who's responsible. Now we're going to take a break, come back, and you're going to hear what she has to say. Then I'll open it for your calls. Please stay with us. Happy New Year to all of you. Do you have a New Year resolution? Have you thought of one yet? Well, I have, and I'll tell you all about it in some time. Let's first talk about yours. Is your New Year resolution to get fit? You'll then have to wait for the Wuhan virus pandemic to end. How else will you go out for a run? Is your New Year resolution to save money? You will have to wait for the pandemic to end again. How else will the economy recover? How else will your salary or your business grow? Is your New Year resolution to travel? You will have to wait for the travel bans to end. How else will you get there? Is your New Year resolution to have a family? Well, there's the Wuhan virus in the air. Welcome to 2021. We are still in the middle of a pandemic. It has taken an entire year from our lives. It has taken our jobs, our loved ones. The virus from Wuhan is not done yet. There is a new strain now. So the world is on repeat mode. Infections, lockdowns, pain. Who bears the cost of this? Hello and welcome to Gravitas Plus. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. 1945 to 1962, the U.S. government conducted 200 nuclear tests. They were in Nevada, Arizona, Washington and New Mexico. The radiation killed over 400,000 people. The U.S. government had to compensate. Nearly $100,000 were paid to each family. 1984, the Bhopal gas tragedy. Around 20,000 people died. Half a million survived. 
with respiratory and eye problems, the Union Carbide Corporation had to cough up $470 million. 1986, the Chernobyl nuclear plant disaster. 350,000 people were affected. The Soviet Union paid $1.12 billion in compensation. 1989, Exxon Valdez oil tanker spill. Exxon spent $3.8 billion on the cleanup and it was slapped with a $5 billion bill in punitive damages. 2010, Deepwater Horizon oil spill, the largest oil spill in history, an estimated 206 million gallons of oil spilled in the Gulf of Mexico. 11 people died, 17 were injured. Oil company BP was made to pay $65 billion. 2020 Beirut blast, 204 people dead, more than 6,500 injured. Lebanon Prime Minister had to step down. The investigation is on. 2020, the Wuhan virus pandemic, nearly 2 million deaths and 83 million infections. Why is China not being made to pay? For every man-made disaster in history, the perpetrators have had to compensate. Why should the Wuhan virus pandemic be an exception? This is the greatest economic blow since the Great Depression, the biggest crisis of our generation. 24 million students are out of school for good. 400 million jobs have been lost so far, 89 million in South Asia alone. 45 million in Africa, 34 million in Latin America. Recession has hit all five continents. 26% of the world's businesses were closed at some point or the other. Around 100,000 businesses have shut shop in the United States alone, and that's just according to one estimate. The University of California, Santa Cruz, for example, says 317,000 American businesses were closed down between February and September 2020. That's 1,500 closures per day. 1,500 per day. Look at insolvencies. An increase of 57% in North America, 34% in Eastern Europe, 32% in Western Europe, 33% in Latin America, and 31% in Asia. Let me give you a glimpse of the companies that have filed for bankruptcy. Gold's Gym, the parent company of Wendy's and Pizza Hut, Aldo, Brooks Brothers, Muji, J.C. Penney, J. Crew, Le Pain Quotidien, California Pizza Kitchen, Flybe Airlines, Virgin Atlantic, Latam Airlines, Thai Airways, Nok Airlines, Air Deccan, Blue Air, Air Mauritius, Level Europe. This is what apocalypse looks like. Who bears the cost? What should the world's New Year resolution be? Make China pay. Hold it accountable. Where do you start? Well, right here. Let's begin by looking at the amount that China should be made to pay. $16 trillion. That's how much the Wuhan virus has reportedly cost us in 2020. 16 trillion, that's the economic cost alone. The travel and tourism industry, for example, shrunk by 42.1%. Europe was the most impacted in this sector. The number of flights scheduled worldwide was down by more than 40% as of December 2020. In February 2020, it was down by more than 70% year on year. Passenger aviation is estimated to have lost $314 billion last year. The aviation industry is down to its knees. Global trade is no different. It declined around 9.2% annually. The food and beverage industry suffered a 22% loss in turnover globally. Automobile, around 20%. If you're watching us from West Asia, you must know that the region lost nearly $270 billion worth of oil income. $270 billion. All because of the Wuhan virus pandemic, India is expected to be the worst affected among the major world economies. The lockdown alone cost India $26 billion. A report by Oxford Economics claims India's annual output would be 12% below pre-virus levels through 2025. All of this because of the Wuhan virus pandemic. Who will bear this cost? Europe is expected to shrink by more than 7%. Spain and the United Kingdom are likely to be the worst affected in this region. Their GDP decline more than 12% and 10% respectively. Now look at what the pandemic has done to the United States. In the second quarter of 2020, America's GDP fell 32.4%. 32.4. Numbers not seen since the Great Depression. Unemployment hit 14.7%. 
the highest since the Second World War. Do you know countries had to compensate for that war too? The United States, for example, had to pay $20,000 to each surviving Japanese detainee. Japan had to pay $6.67 million in compensation to former prisoners of war. Germany was billed around $38.6 billion. Italy had to pay $360 million. Finland, $300 million. Hungary, $300 million. Romania, $300 million. Bulgaria, $70 million. Why then are world leaders so scared of billing China for the pandemic? The virus pushed Australia to its sharpest dive since the Great Depression. In June 2020, Australia's economy shrank 7%. Australia entered recession for the first time in 28 years. Indonesia entered recession for the first time in 22 years. It was the first time in history for India too. Germany, the United Kingdom, Japan, South Korea, United States, Brazil, Singapore, Thailand. The pandemic pushed all of these countries into recession. Who is responsible for this? China. $16 trillion worth of loss. Dear leaders, bill it to China. Address your bills to this man. Make China pay. And for starters, stop paying China. Europe lost nearly 480,000 people to the Wuhan virus. It is now signing investment treaties with China. Bahrain lost more than 350 people to the virus. At least 90,000 were infected. Guess what it's doing? Bahrain is thanking Beijing by buying the Chinese vaccine. So is the United Arab Emirates, Morocco, Turkey, Indonesia, Brazil. Why is the world still doing business with China? And if China were really sorry, why isn't it offering to bear the cost of global vaccination to start with? Look at what China is doing instead. It first pushed economies into recession, and now it is profiteering by selling them medical kits and vaccines. Brazil, for example, has already been billed $90 million for the initial 46 million doses of the Chinese vaccine, a classic case of the perpetrator emerging victorious. In 2021, Let's boycott China. Let's rethink global supply chains. Do it for the families who lost their loved ones, for the batch of 2020 that never graduated, the healthcare workers who will never come back home, for our resolutions of 2020 that never saw the light of day. This year, make China pay. Gravitas Plus. Okay. What do you think? Do you think that we should hold special investigations, which the government is incapable of doing? Comey, that was a joke. Durham, that was a joke, is a joke. Mueller, that's a joke. The establishment will not sacrifice its own. And so you cannot expect the FBI or any of the department's special investigators to do anything. This is going to require independent investigative journalists the Glenn Greenwalls, the Celia Farbers, the, uh, the, the people who are not afraid to tell the truth. And then you're going to see a whole lot of people falsely profiting. I'm going to share the latest now with you, and then we're going to hear from Elizabeth Cormick, who has some of your questions. Will the COVID vaccine meet its promises? Well, daily we hear and observe a stream of endless propaganda about the miracles of the new generation of COVID vaccines in order to calm fears and increase public compliance. Top health officials and popular politicians and celebrities are jumping before the cameras to be the first to receive these vaccines. In unison, editors at the New York Times, the Washington Post, and virtually all the major multimedia networks encourage everyone to be vaccinated as soon as as enough vaccines are available. Anthony Fauci and the captains in the pandemic efforts claim Moderna and Pfizer's vaccines are about 95% effective. That's simply propaganda. That is public relations nonsense. A clear and, and very articulate uh, interest from, uh, not an articulate interest, but a, but a specific interest in what are the actual facts. I'll show you that they are making claims they cannot support. In fact, the Department of Health and Human Services director went on television to meet the press and said, oh, yeah, these are safe and effective. How would he know? It takes years to determine the efficacy and safety, not days, not hours. Therefore, we should all be willing to stand in a waiting line? I don't think so. 
There's nothing to be concerned about, we're told. We are just expected to be concerned about any anti-vaccine because they're heretics, aren't they? That's what the World Health Organization feels. They've now dubbed anyone who challenges the safety and efficacy of any vaccine as one of the 10 most dangerous risks to global health. What the media blitzkrieg is ignoring are the very legitimate and even worrisome unanswered questions on the minds of many citizens. Aside from concerns over these vaccines' uncertainties for effectiveness and safety due to quickly being fast-tracked past in the usual regulatory analysis and reviews, Moderna and Pfizer's vaccines are largely experimental. Never before has an RNA vaccine been distributed en masse to tens of millions of people. Other suspicions include the length of time neutralizing antibodies are effective before immunity wanes, what kind of protection the vaccines will actually offer, does the data truly support Moderna and Pfizer's claims that their vaccines are 95% effective, are vaccine recipients protected from contracting the virus, and if not, can they transmit the virus once they're immunized? The absence of long-term safety profiles following vaccinations are still pending. The Pfizer Phase three trials lasted less than four months. Moderna only completed its COV uh, trial enrollment on October 22nd. Now, a couple months later, people are receiving the vaccine. This has never been done before. Therefore, insufficient time has lapsed to make any realistic clinical determination about either vaccine safety following months after vaccination. Yet despite these questions, over half of Americans believe that being vaccinated will provide complete immunity from infection, and therefore their lives will return to normal. Nothing could be further from the truth. You're being lied to. Now the most recent narrative we are witnessing is stoking public fear that unless we are vaccinated, we will be unable to board a plane or train. We will be prevented from attending any schools from uh, from kindergarten to graduate school. We will be prevented from attending public events and may even become victims to more austere and harsh quarantine laws. There's also the lingering myth of the PCR test as a reliable standard for diagnosing COVID infections. Yet that is the test we're using worldwide. That is the test promoted by Anthony Fauci and, and Bill Gates. But due to the widespread abuse of PCR, which was never designed, never intended to be relied upon as a confirmatory diagnostic tool, a growing number of medical experts argue that the U.S., the U.K., Germany, and the other United Kingdom or United uh, European Union nations are facing a case demic rather than a pandemic due to a pathogenic virus. Despite PCR's high rate of misdiagnosis, and positive results are still being reported as COVID cases, meaning a person may test positive and have no virus of this kind in their body, and suddenly they're a case. And that is completely fraudulent science. That is gaming the system, meaning you lie about how many people are actually dying from the virus instead of comorbidities, or how many people have the virus, as if having a virus is the same as having a disease. If that were the case, 90% more or less of the American population would all be diagnosed as having herpes disease instead of being infect infected for the rest of their life possibly, but never manifesting a symptom. They're playing everyone because people are not aware of real science. In early December, the New England Journal of Medicine published a National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease Analysis of the Moderna vaccine's length of efficacy based upon neutralizing antibody levels. This was the first data published of its kind for any of the COVID vaccines. Although the analysis only included 34 individuals, that's it, 34 individuals in a country of over 340 million people. They had received both shots. It found that antibody counts were significant over a three-month period, averaging between 50 to 75 percent. The report stated, quote, less than we were hoping for, end quote. 
the rate of antibody decline increased among the older trial participants. That means in America, about 100 million Americans. This disappointing result should not be a surprise, although even a sharp drop in antibodies may still provide sufficient immunity, at least for some. The most recent issue of the British Medical Journal reports that nat natural immunity following infection lasts approximately six months. Yet this study conducted by Oxford University hospitals likely has serious flaws since it relied upon, you guessed it, the PCR for diagnosing the data. That means it's completely, totally, unequivocally unreliable. Furthermore, Moderna has also been using its RNA technology for vaccines against several influenza strains. A similar pattern of antibody decline was noted in their flu vaccine, showing effectiveness for about six months, and then an antibody drop-off of almost 90%. What does that mean, then? Does it mean that since both the vaccinated and unvaccinated who have COVID uh, could expect about a three to six months of natural immunity? But if you get the vaccine, you're going to have 90% less or only 10% immunity after that period of time. Wouldn't that necessitate having constant vaccines, two per year, for the, let's say, the next three or four years, depending upon this and other strains? So how much protection will the new RNA COVID vaccines provide and for how long? No one knows. It's all guess. It's all I guess only time and further monitoring of vaccine recipients will tell. Another important question on people's minds is whether they can still be infected. Can I get the disease if I've been vaccinated? And whether they can transmit it. If I'm vaccinated, can I then continue to transmit the virus to people in my family or at work? Well, in principle, vaccine proponents argue that the vaccine prevents both infection and transmission. That's not true. But the data does not support this conclusion. It is well known that persons vaccinated against the flu will frequently contract and the virus and become ill and spread it to others. This is largely because we're dealing with viruses that enter the upper respiratory tract by way of the mucous layer in the nose and the throat. For this, reason Anthony Fauci has continued to state that vaccinated people should continue to wear masks and observe social distancing to avoid transmitting the virus. So let's say everybody's vaccinated, 340 million Americans. Fauci's saying, you still got to wear your mask. You still got to, well, then what has changed? Then why the vaccine? Since the vaccine will not protect us from getting the virus, nor prevent us from transmitting the virus. The World Health Organization has stated there is, quote, listen carefully, quote, no evidence on any of the vaccines to be confident that it's going to prevent people from actually getting the infection and therefore being able to pass it on. That's the World Health Organization. Back in October, Dr. Peter Doshi, at the time an editor for the British Medical Journal, had already warned that the latter vaccine clinical trials were never properly designed to determine whether it would reduce the likelihood of falling ill nor prevent infection. Repeatedly, Bill Gates, Fauci, and all the media pundits tell us that unless there is a large vaccine compliance, the transmission of COVID will never be interrupted. Never? You mean for the rest of our lives or till next year or the year after? They're going to play this as long as they can be paid. That's the bottom line. However, based upon what we are learning, these new COVID vaccines have always been and remain an unsupported illusion to realistically ending the pandemic. Another important piece of the information is that very rarely mentioned is COVID-19's four to five day incubation period. In the event of a person is asymptomatically infected with a virus, the CDC states, quote, RNA vaccines are not currently recommended for an outbreak management or for post-exposure prophylactics, which is vaccination to prevent the development of SARS-2 infection in a person with a specific known exposure. Because the medium incubation period is four to five days, it is unlikely that the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine will provide an adequate immune response 
within the incubation period for effective post-exposure prophylactics. Thus, vaccination is unlikely to be effective in preventing disease following exposure, end quote. Reports are already coming in to confirm this. Recently, hundreds of Israelis became infected with the virus after receiving Pfizer's COVID vaccine. There may be several reasons for this. First, were the vaccine recipients already carrying the virus at the time of vaccination? Second, it takes 8 to 10 days for immunity to sufficiently increase after receiving the vaccine. And after the first dose, there's only a 50% efficacy. This is why the second shot for the RNA vaccine is so crucial in order to reach the magical 95% effectiveness, which itself is a theoretical model. Now that the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are being administered throughout the U.S., 4.6 million recipients since January 4th, and in other nations, we're beginning to read reports about serious adverse effects. Recent COVID vaccine injuries have started to be reported in the CDC's vaccine adverse event reporting system. During a seven-day period, December 15th, 22nd, there was 1,158 cases entered. However, this is but a fraction, albeit significant, of the actual number of adverse events. On December 19th, the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices convened to review the cases of life-threatening anaphylaxis following RNA vaccination. In his presentation to the working group, Dr. Thomas Clark presented statistics showing that there was a minimum of 3,150, quote, health impact events among 112,000 people. Well, that do the math. 2.7% adverse reactions on, in just five days post uh, this, and including deaths. Moreover, there was 3,150 adverse events tagged, quote, unable to perform normal daily activities, unable to work, require care from a doctor or health care professional, end quote. That's in addition. The presentation did not include the number of minor or moderate adverse events, which are likely to be higher. In early October, we reported on COVID-19 vaccine risks, stated by Dr. Sukharit Bacardi, the former chair of microbiology at the University of Mainz Medical School in Germany. Among those risks is the possibility of the vaccine's RNA contributing to mutagenesis in reproductive cells that may be inherited later by children. Subsequently, the University of Miami has reported it is following up on its earlier discovery of the virus present in men's testicles up to six months after infection. Now the researchers are investigating whether the vaccine's COVID genetic information may do likewise and interfere with sperm quality and reproduction. That's serious because that means that a lot of couples could end up having miscarriages or birth defects because of this. Now, the final question is, why are we failing to discuss, let alone adhere, to the precautionary principle before this massive undertaking to produce and distribute and potentially billions of vaccines to inoculate the global population? The precautionary principle quite simply states that any new medical intervention with results that are either disputed or unknown or are dangerous, should be avoided. In fact, the principle has frequently been invoked for products or processes that would introduce genetically modified organisms or foods for consumption. Now we're injecting questionable genetically engineered substances into human bodies. And worse, there are voices that want to mandate this enormously expensive experiment long before any reliable medical consensus can be reached on their long-term safety. If the precautionary principle had been respected and honored during the past hundred years, the U.S. would have prevented untold numbers of lifelong injuries and deaths due to the public advertising for smoking, asbestos use, DDT poisoning, synthetic hormone replacement therapy, toxic pesticides such as Monsanto's glyphosate found in Roundup, AZT during the early part of the AIDS epidemic where they were offering 1,600 milligrams a day. Today, any doctor would lose their license if they gave that amount. And hundreds of thousands of people died because of the toxic reactions of the medication. 
and the swine flu and Gardasil vaccines that were also rushed to market without proper scientific oversight. The U.S. government has an atrocious track record for introducing toxic chemicals to the American public, then denying all responsibility for their adverse effects and the indescribable suffering that their shortcomings and short-sightedness has caused. It is only well after the tragedy gains some public attention that a whistleblower or someone, generally a journalist, comes forward to reveal the wrongdoings and corruption behind the companies developing these toxic products. And how often do we find the government, the regulatory agencies, and the mainstream media being the primary source to expose these felonies? How about almost never? In fact, they're the ones protecting the industries, not prosecuting them. Even when protective laws are enacted, such as the Clean Air and Clean Food and Clean Water and Clean Energy Acts, corporate lobbyists and big money apply their trade to buy off legislators and heads of federal agencies to gradually scrub away these law safeguards. This is part of the corporate cancel culture to race our protections. These trends that have become ingrained into the American public's body politic have led to today's largest propaganda campaign in American history and is now orchestrated by the CDC, the National Institutes of Health, in collusion with the pharmaceutical industry complex, which of course at the top of that is Bill Gates, Anthony Fauci, and many of our leading corporate-funded medical schools and institutions and across the ideological spectrum of the media. All are heavily invested in the new generation of COVID vaccines and whatever new novel drugs in the pipeline and to invalidate the highly effective and cheap drugs such as hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin that have been proven to treat COVID infections quickly and safely. This is the same artifice of corporate scoundrels and their media escorts that have relied on faulty science, fabricated science, and all in their own financial interest. And then they hide behind a cloak of non-transparency who Fauci now encourages us to open-heartedly trust as COVID vaccines reach your local clinic and downtown pharmacies. There may be no reason to doubt Fauci and our health agencies sincerity and determination to protect the health of Americans during this crisis. However, their competence to do so effectively is an entirely different matter. Sadly, their past track records of colluding and showing favoritism to private interest over public health should top the list of our concerns. Whatever the long-term consequences from this massive vaccination campaign, you may praise it, you may condemn it. There may even be criminal accusations that will ultimately rest upon the shoulders of our nation's leaders, such as Anthony Fauci, Bill Gates, and Monsef Slowe. In conclusion, now these same people who were wrong about the H1N1, wrong about the swine flu pandemic, they've been wrong on almost all major public health issues. Now, supposedly, they're supposed to get it right, and now they're trying to mandate that we must take it. New York State is even trying to enact law now that they can come to your home and forcibly remove you if they deem you a threat based upon spreading a virus. That is not good. That should concern all New Yorkers. And if New Yorker does it, then watch the Californians do it. And then watch the people in Vermont and other states that follow New York's lead do it, New Jersey. So we do not have the sanctity and freedom of our body as we once thought and assumed. We have turned over almost all of our rights to a group of technocrats, bureaucrats, and oligarchs. Is that the best choice we can make? I'm Gary Nall. Thank you all for listening and have a nice day.